Hello, everyone. Welcome to Niagara 101 for Specifying Engineers, our 2024 version. My name is Michael Stabile, and I've been hosting this series for a couple of years. Uh, we've got a new version today, and I actually would love to welcome uh, or introduce you to Jerome Bergquist, one of our sales engineers who will be accompanying me today. Jerome, can you give him a little background on you? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Jerome Bergquist. I am a sales engineer for Tritium, as uh, seen on the slide here. I've been in the industry now for uh, coming up on a decade and a half or so. Uh, and been doing all aspects from specifying controls to designing systems to troubleshooting and things of that sort. Thank you, Drew. So today, as I noted, we're doing Niagara 101, and we've done this in the past. And I just, for all of you attending, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we designed this series for specifying engineers because we do get a lot of questions around you know, what's Niagara, who's Tritium, what, you know, what does this mean? What, what does Jace mean? Um, you know, why would I specify Niagara? Uh, today's session is not a, uh, this is not a technical deep dive session. We do have many of those. In fact, and I'll outline uh, later on the number of previous specifier series sessions that we've done that, you know, that go further in depth on certain areas for specifiers. But additionally, uh, you'll see through the day, a number of resources and pro tips videos and different things that uh, talk about this. So if you're a specifier and you're new to uh, Niagara and Tritium, uh, hopefully this will provide you some groundwork. Also, please understand that we are here to help. Um, we are, uh, we like to call ourselves agnostic. Uh, you'll, you'll understand what that means in a little bit. And most importantly, we just want you to understand what resources are available for you. So with that, let's get started. Tritium is nothing if not a, a, a basis in partnership. Uh, we've been around nearly, uh, almost nearly 30 years uh, as became an independent, or we're no, we became a wholly owned subsidiary of Honeywell in around 2005. Uh, we are the global leader in open platform building automation, and we'll talk about what open means as we go along. But uh, in terms of partners, uh, we have, you know, a thousand developer partners. There's as you can see, 25,000 plus uh, certified professionals who can help you uh, do integration work in your sites. Um, we have many uh, 60 plus OEM partners, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, you know, the big brands that are out there all carrying some form of Niagara um, in, in devices in, in their lines, uh, worldwide, uh, 77 plus countries, and as, as you know, uh, 5,000 plus distributors. And we are nearing uh, the 1.4 million instances of Niagara that have been deployed uh, in the marketplace today. So with that, the first question we a lot of times get and people will say, well, I, I need you know, what, to understand what, what's Tritium and what's Niagara. So Tritium is the company, Niagara is the product, Niagara is a framework. Uh, that framework is software. So at our core, uh, we are software developers. We get deployed on hardware, and, and uh, Jerome's going to talk about the hardware in a minute, but our software comes in a number of forms. So the, the Niagara software, Niagara 4, uh, we're going to reference a little bit of Niagara 5 that's coming soon. The Niagara supervisor, which is essentially the Niagara software that we would put on a server to aggregate, bring our histories up and alarms and do all kind of that type of work supervisory over an entire series or many buildings. Uh, Niagara Analytics, which is built into the core of Niagara, our eSign application, uh, which is a CFR 21 CFR uh, Part 11, uh, help you to gain compliance for that. Uh, various drivers that are available to connect to legacy systems or different types of systems. And then uh, newest is our Niagara Cloud Suite of uh, services that are out there for uh, Niagara Data Service to connect to third-party applications. Uh, like recently, you may have seen uh, a webinar that we did, a, a specifier series talk on connecting to um, Autodesk Tandem, uh, as well as Niagara Remote, which is remote engineering and viewing, and Niagara Recover, which is the off-site, off-prem uh, backup capabilities. In terms of hardware, Jerome? Yeah, so Tritium also produces some hardware. Uh, there's Jace's there's edge devices. Uh, the part of that is the VEC 10 or the edge 10 device. And then also the expansion modules. 
Uh, we sell them under the Vicon brand. So when you see that branding, that's ours, kind of like the organic version, if you will, nothing added to it. And then also you'll see it from all of our OEM partners as well, and it'll have their branding. When you look at the devices, you'll realize, oh, these these look very similar, aside from you know branding clips. You'll see a picture of what we mean by that. Um, basically, the names of them are changed, and then also the software underneath. They, each of them has their own uh, kind of added flavor, if you will. Um, and then on top of that, we also have enterprise security uh, hardware as well that we uh, sell and distribute. Okay. And just one quick note there, and, and uh, Jerome mentions that we sell. We don't sell anything directly. So Jerome and I are agnostic. Um, all products, whether it's the Vicon products that, that he's referencing that are Tritium branded, go through distribution and available through normal distribution partners and integrators, as well as all the OEMs who sell through their distribution and integration partners. So we are here and we make no, you know, no distinction between those. They are all Niagara devices, which we support. And that's an important clarification on the distribution there as well, right? Because it, when, when folks and specifiers specifiers and engineers are looking to get a Niagara system into their building. Um, oftentimes, or it's not uncommon for them to try and reach out directly to us. And, and it's, it, it's all through distribution partners. So. Okay. Now, if there is one thing that we, we do that I can say where we, we sell something directly, that is the professional services organization. Uh, we have a team of people who, help our partners, but also do direct work with, uh, as you'll see, OEM development. Uh, you might see uh, different types of devices coming onto the market, the VRS, for example, um, you know, people who want to add Niagara to their uh, portfolios, our team might help them create custom development around Niagara, uh, utilizing those devices, custom drivers, um, and Jerome will talk about some of our training where you can build your own drivers, but our team is available to do drivers. And then our team also uh, can do system audits where they go out and look at a best practices scenario around uh, a, a facility or a group of facilities or how best to advise to, to do something in conjunction uh, with our partners or directly within customers. Yeah, and then as far as the training goes that we offer, uh, we have training classes uh, ranging from the basic uh, Niagara certification, it's referred to as a TCP certification. That's kind of the baseline of take this class and then you have the certification needed in order to uh, work within the Niagara Workbench tool or Workplace tool. Um, and you can go from there. From that on up, we also have a focused Niagara analytics course uh, to use our analytics service, help you understand that, and all the way to a really in-depth developer course. You'll notice there's also that operator end user training there as well. Uh, we have quite a few end users of the product um, of all the different brands who want to be self-maintaining, right? Facilities, teams, things like that. They wanna know uh, what is happening in my building and in the, in the software that's making it happen. And so we also have operator end user training um, that'll, that'll help get them on the road as well. Okay, thank you, Jerome. So as we mentioned, Niagara is a framework. Uh, it's, it really is something that enables critical facilities around the world to work. And, and our customers are varied, uh, very uh, large organizations, uh, those that need high levels of security, uh, those that have many facilities, it's right down to your local uh, community building, church, school, whatever it may be, Niagara is able to scale and fit almost any kind of an environment, but is predominantly known for our levels of cybersecurity, which is why you see uh, people like the DOD and the State Department and others who utilize Niagara extensively. In fact, uh, recently, uh, we are very proud to say, and this is GSA's own uh, press release, uh, that uh, the GSA uh, has selected Niagara-based uh, solutions for, you know, from Tritium uh, for their facilities to be installed. So we understand many of you may be here because you're running into your, your specifying Niagara or you're specifying GSA buildings and you need to learn more about Niagara. And we can certainly help you with that. We keep a very close relationship with the GSA. Again, you know, it might be 
any of a number of the uh, OEM versions that you will install there. It's usually always dependent upon what's uh, the base system in the building or maybe the legacy system in the building. But in any case, whatever brand it might be, uh, we are prepared and have a team to help you in terms of uh, complying to some of the standards and things that, that GSA likes in terms of security and certainly connecting you with them to get uh, uh, their devices registered under their asset managers so they can manage their uh, environments more effectively. So today, in terms of why Niagara, we're going to look at four areas here. So as you can see them, obviously, compatibility and flexibility, and we've kind of talked a little bit about that. The risk mitigation that I referenced with the cybersecurity capabilities, cost savings that we, we again, referenced in the sense of having many different vendors to choose from, as well as thousands of integrators, and then future proofing that you'll see as well. And with that, we'll really get started on the compatibility and flexibility. So. Here, uh, Jerome, we'll uh, start off with you. Yeah, so we'll start with uh, HVAC equipment, right? HVAC equipment is, that's where we started. That's really the core of uh, what you'll see Niagara being used for, even though we can be used across pretty much anything, right? Uh, a Niagara BAS typically acts or building automation system. Sorry, I used an acronym without first uh, defining it. A Niagara BAS typically acts as a central hub and controller to the mechanical, mechanical equipment in the building or buildings of a campus. Uh, this is, an, and I'll reference it again later, but the, the Niagara BAS is, the framework is inherently scalable. So it could be a single small building. It could be a collection of small buildings. It could be a nationwide or global assembly of of buildings all stacked on top of each other looking at their hvac equipment handling scheduling handling alarming uh alarming and trends things of that matter okay now in the lower left uh one of the more common uh after hvac one of the more common uses you'll find is lighting water and power certainly uh these days, maybe running on back net but previously more often running on uh, mod bus uh so you know, uh, lighting control, but now uh, submetering, uh, photovoltaic arrays, measuring water, et cetera. So all types of devices and areas that get uh, integrated with Niagara. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it can also integrate occupancy, usage, and condition sensors, right? Uh, sensors and packages of sensors. Anything can be monitored if it sends a signal is kind of the way I like to think about it. Uh, you could have people counters to count how many people are coming and going into a building or into a space every day. People detectors to try and do real-time occupancy as opposed to only scheduled occupancy. You could have air conditions like humidity levels or a leak detector in a mechanical room. You can check for environmental conditions like noise levels, right? Human environmental conditions as well as VOCs or other compounds in the air to consider as well. And then obviously things like flow meters, uh, energy meters, uh, things of that sort. Okay. And then finally on the upper right, the safety and access. Uh, Jerome referenced it with the hardware earlier on our enterprise security. Uh, that allows us to integrate uh, door access controls. So whether it's a card access solution or biometric access solution, uh, whether we're driving cameras, uh, or video walls and integrating that in, uh, whether it's monitoring equipment uh, with a camera on a utility room or a, a particular room to see what's going on or just you know security cameras outside. And then of course, things like the fire control systems where while we don't control fire, fire is its own thing, uh, we can ingest the data from fire typically sent off uh, uh, perhaps on a serial or a back net and we can take that data and use it to uh, inform uh, your dashboards or control other equipment that maybe you want to have certain things going on uh, at times when emergency or other situations arise. Yeah, so <clears throat> there really is a, a, like the title says, limitless device integrations, right? Um, sometimes I, if the question is, uh, what can be integrated, the answer is yes. Uh, I say that kind of tongue in cheek, but it's not an untrue statement. 
Uh, there's many types of equipment and devices, as well as the protocols that are supported within the Niagara framework. Um, you can see here kind of an example, right, from lighting to HVAC equipment, central plants, things, you know, that we've already mentioned once or twice. Uh, there's data centers and irrigation and refrigeration equipment, right? And then down below there is, a, is kind of a short list of uh, some of the protocols, right? So we have a very broad support of protocols, and that comes down to what software drivers are installed on the JSE, on the supervisor. Um, and there are many, many drivers available within the Niagara marketplace already or can be created if one needs to be. Um, legacy protocols like N2 or LawnWorks all the way through the cutting edge stuff like BACnet SC, right? Or LoRaWAN, right? Um, currently, a huge amount of the industry operates on BACnet and Modbus. Uh, however, we also kind of cover the full gamut. On top of that, there's also the IoT protocols, right? So MQTT is frequently used uh, for IoT devices and that is equally supported. And one of the important things to remember here is, as Jerome talks about the protocols is, you know, back from our very beginning is, is we provided uh, protocol support, you know, looked at the industry, saw what was uh, gaining popularity, what would gain support. And we really worked hard to ensure we supported those so that uh, a, an owner or building uh, designer or manager could actually uh, get the best of any world, get the best equipment in and, and not be confined to a legacy or proprietary system that might only uh, support devices from that single company. We allowed uh, owners to uh, mix and match and, and bring things together. And that really kind of plays back to this connecting to legacy systems. So early on in our days, uh, you could have, and I'll use a college campus as an example, you know, every building that gets built has uh, someone's donating, it all goes out to bid, it might be a different uh, automation system that's put into that building. And all of a sudden, you've got a campus with three, four, five different uh, types of systems that are running. And of course, you've got three or four or five different monitors and someone swiveling between uh, systems to control it. And there's there's just no single way to view the entirety of your network. And so Niagara really gained a, a foothold in the sense of being able to aggregate all of that information under a Niagara supervisor and communicate back and forth with those legacy systems that might be in each building. Uh, now, you know, whether that was back net IP or OPC server, you know, communication, um, you know, the good news is, is you got one view. The bad news is you really still have those legacy devices in each of the buildings. But as you can see on the right side, there are, you know, many drivers that were developed over the years to provide uh, uh, bi-directional, you know, command and control capabilities to monitor and see what was going on. So, you know, some, I just put some of the most popular ones up here that you might recognize in, in uh, legacy buildings, because remember everything was, you know, rather everything was kind of uh, stacked in silos at, at a particular time. So uh, this really helped with that scenario. Yeah, so <clears throat> if we take a, a little bit of a closer look into the integration options, we're going to kind of have three examples that I'll walk you through. At the start, uh, we're going to take a look at what uh, Michael was just describing, right? This is effectively an overlay. This is the quickest way to get every, relatively quickest way to get everything into a single system, uh, allowing you to work with myriad legacy systems, right? This will not fix any issues though. Uh, if the existing system has uh, security shortcomings, it, you know, any operational things of that sort that are on the existing system, this is an overlay over the top. It works well for some, and it is a quick way to get into uh, the Niagara framework environment, right? And so next up, we're going to take a look at integrating with field controllers. This is another spot where our, uh, our ability to, to communicate with proprietary protocols comes in handy, right? So the examples here, one is JCI, one is train. I'll, I'll talk about the JCI one on the left here for a moment. Uh, this would be the example of replacing uh, JCI NAE is the central controller. Um, with a JACE, right? 
earlier when I we've been talking about Jace's um a Jace is an acronym. I, I caught myself using BAS as an acronym without defining it. A Jace is an acronym as well. It's a Java application control engine. So let's put that out there so you know. Um, here we're taking all of those field controllers from the device and we're bringing it up into the Jace as the central controller. Now <clears throat> you have the security benefits at the Jace. There's still potential issues at the field controllers and any field controller issues uh, you'll still have. This is more in depth and more integrated than just the overlay. And then that'll bring us to our third one here. Our third option is a full top to bottom uh, integration, right? So this would be selecting and uh, selecting and installing or selecting for, for uh, specifiers, it'd be selecting and specifying what controllers are going into place, what protocols are going to be used, what bus type is going to be used, right? There can be MSTP, there can be IP, there can be, you know, whatever method you are using to uh, build the trunk of communication back to the JSON. This is going to be inherently more secure and also inherently more uh, comprehensive. Okay. And as Jerome mentions here, the security wise, you'll see those, those green icons on there um, and note at the upper right, they, they stand for encrypted communication uh, from the JACE back up into the network, as well as certificate management. So we have device certificates available. Uh, oftentimes when we work with customers, uh, we'll find that doing uh, by being able to pull in a, a, a JACE or a, a device like this at some level in their organization allows them to maintain the old, uh, perhaps obsolete equipment that you saw underneath that uh, for some time, extend the life, give them cybersecurity capability, and then deal with their upgrades as they can afford to, you know, in a planned fashion, I'm going to do this floor, then this floor, then this floor, or I'm going to deal with my problem children. I've got some failures. Uh, let me take out these devices or some critical uh, needs, but it lets them plan rather than trying to have to back a truck up and, you know, do an entire building, which could be not just a, you know, very expensive in terms of hardware, but the labor and time uh, to do that could be very uh, uh, prohibitive. So, uh, allows you to do a planned transition, or as we say, to you know, eat that elephant one bite at a time in large projects. Now, I've added this uh, slide, and we call this the, the NIC statement of the Niagara Information and Conformance Statement. Um, this is what helps you. It's in our specifications. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show you the documents we have later and reference them. Uh, but it's a statement that you can put into your specification in order to ensure that you get an open network, that someone's not locking you down to uh, device specific or manufacturer specific devices. So it's basically making sure that there's no brand specific, but that it's an open network and that we have a, a, a means of programming our devices that we're not locked in in some way, uh, you know, where a customer uh, might be put into a corner and have to, to buy certain things or do things they didn't necessarily want. So make sure that everybody's aware and that we have everybody on the same playing field and know what's going on. And again, we'll talk about where this document sits and it's also in our uh, Div 25. So with that, we're now into the risk mitigation section. So cybersecurity, which we do take very seriously uh, and you'll see you know, I'm not, I'm not going to read all these off, but you'll see we have very, uh, very extensive cybersecurity uh, means. We call it a, a defense in depth. Um, I want to note in here from uh, the last time, a couple of years ago, when we did our sessions and we talked about writing cybersecurity specs. At that time, we had uh, someone actually asking us, you know, why don't we do uh, 62443? Why aren't we promoting that? And Niagara 4 was actually developed from the very start uh, with the, uh, with the, with 62443 in mind, uh, the, able to, the ability to run an, uh, uh, an industrial automation control system. And uh, recently, uh, we and Honeywell have gained certification because it's not just the device, it's actually all the, the manufacturing, the software and the updates and, and uh, your procedures behind the scenes. So very important there, we do have uh, 62443. Um, it is encrypted communications, as, as I mentioned, and 
you see with TLS uh, 1.3 at the bottom, uh, digitally signed codes, and of course, uh, Jerome's going to talk about some of these protocols or some of the security uh, certifications uh, a little bit later on here. Yeah, so when we take a look at uh, how we make security, uh, what you'll what we'll also call hardening, how we make it a uh, an achievable thing relatively easily uh, is through one of the ways is the security dashboard, right? And the security dashboard exists within every Niagara station, um, starting at, I think it was version 4.7. Is that right, Michael? I think 4.8. 4.8. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Starting at 4.8, we introduced the security dashboard. Uh, it natively gives you a way to identify and triage any potential security issues. Here you can see some examples of it, right? Uh, some When there's critical issues, they show red. When there's concerns or areas to be cautious of, they show yellow. And then, hey, you're good to go, shows up as green, right? And this is a, this is a top to bottom look at your station. Uh, along with that, you can program in any parameters into the dashboard uh, that you want. So this isn't only security, right? This can also be used to, you can build a widget to see if, uh, if all commissioning tasks that you specify have been completed across the station. Um, and then back to security, have all hardening tasks been completed? Have all of the users changed their password from the initial password that was configured for them? Is everybody using uh, a, an encrypted or a secure connection? Um, yeah, things of that sort. And then one more thing to note on a supervisor, we, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, uh, but just to clarify, a station effectively exists within a single device, within, within a single controller, uh, and then a supervisor aggregates the rest across the Niagara network, which is an encrypted network, the Fox S connection. Um, and so if you're on a supervisor, your security dashboard does not just show you that local, uh, that local station of the supervisor. It shows you all of the subsequent stations underneath and will allow you to see your entire Niagara network. Uh, is everything taken care of one, as specified on commissioning for new construction, and two, as continued uh, in continued use. So for regular security audits, things of that matter, the security dashboard is a super powerful tool. So with that, I, I really want to stress that how important, if you, you heard what Jerome said there about uh, as a commissioning tool, uh, not just for the customer to use ongoing to see that their, their stations are all in compliance, but to make sure that you can sign off and know everything's been done the way it should be. We really believe that uh, this is, is something powerful for our specifiers and engineers to uh, ensure that the building is deployed the way it was meant to be and that you hold everyone accountable to that spot. So we really feel like it's probably an underutilized capability and that's why we're highlighting it as much as we are here today. So with that, we come to the section about cost savings. And here's where we get into and you get the view as we, we've mentioned before how uh, Tritium has many OEM partners and Niagara is available. And that, you know, as we talk about, we're agnostic. So that Vicon uh, Jace that you see on the upper left, that is the Tritium branded Jace and it's sold through distribution. But likewise, there are over 60 uh, vendors out there. Uh, these are some of the major brands that you might see in North America. Uh, all of these large companies who have Niagara versions uh, in their portfolios. So while Honeywell has uh, certainly their own uh, versions of uh, Comfort Point, et cetera. They, they carry uh, versions of uh, which which integrate Niagara. And as um, Jerome mentioned with Johnson Controls, they have an FX series and the like. So down the line, uh, all of these companies have Niagara versions. And the difference between them is they're running Niagara, but uh, as mentioned, they may have some extra tools, some integration capabilities, some different PX files and the like in order to help with the integration of a building uh, uh, and the equipment in that building that might be from that vendor. So all of their tools help pull that together. Now, why is this cost savings? Well, uh, as you think about it, uh, 
all of these OEMs are, first of all, competing with each other. The integration partners are. You have many integration partners available for jobs, people who have expertise. And so when you're looking somewhere, uh, you can say, well, I need people who have this experience. And you're likely to find them because each of these brands have vendors, uh, have integrators who who can be and are likely servicing and supporting not just the Niagara version, but maybe even the proprietary versions. And so there's a good way to get a lot of support out in the market uh, for your, your projection, and probably a lot of what drives uh, the GSA uh, here, as well as the security with it. Go ahead. And Trump. now, yep. yeah, sorry. Uh, so now in the, in the middle and, and right columns there, you can see that's a return of the list of protocols, right? You saw, you saw these on, on some previous slide as well. These are some of the most common. Um, just about every device you'll see in a building is, is going to be talking about one of these. Most of you probably know that, uh, talking via one of these, I should say. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea, at the bottom, there's there's some others. Open ADR is uh, commonly used by, by utilities, right? So uh, we have a driver to support it, to exchange, right? Um, current usage, other, you know, other, other uh, data points of that sort. And then on the right side is some of our uh, security uh, certifications, if you will, right? Uh, TLS 1.3, FIPS 142, uh, the NIST RMF or the NIST uh, Risk Management Framework. It was developed for the military. It is a DOD-based security mechanism. And Tritium has the artifacts to share with the base or military installation um, needed. So if you have a project where NIST RMF or the risk management framework is specified, this needs to happen, uh, we can provide you with the necessary, uh, what are called artifacts for it. Uh, 62443, Michael already mentioned it some. Uh, this is cybersecurity for industrial applications. Niagara 4 was built to do this. And then uh, right in the middle there is the BACnet SC or BACnet Secure Connect. BACnet SC is the way that the industry is moving. The, the BACnet uh, entity is moving to ensure security. Uh, BACnet protocols are not inherently encrypted. Uh, BACnet Secure Connect is a way, is the, is the way that is coming and, and in some cases is happening now to encrypt end-to-end -end communication of the protocols. It is a web socket uh, application of the, of the BACnet protocol. And it, it, has, it has some extra steps. It's, it's certificate managed from one device to the other. That's why we're over there on the, uh, on the right side with the other security measures. Okay. Thank you, Trump. Before I move off this slide, I guess I should point out the obvious you're probably noticing on the left is that one of these things doesn't look like the others, or a lot of them look the same except for one. Um, that's just the, the, the essence that we do build hardware that uh, we supply for the OEMs and they get branding clips and then they add their software as a difference. So many of these are similar. However, you also notice one of the devices uh, that does not look like that. And we call that our portability partners. Uh, there are a number of those around the world who actually have their own compliant hardware and are able to run Niagara on those. And in this case for Phoenix Contact, it's an industrial design that they wanted in, uh, for their market. And so they had a uh, device and had it certified to run Niagara, even though it doesn't look like the others. So that's, that's why you see what, what that looks like over there. So finally, now we're down to future proofing uh, and, and what that really means uh, for Niagara. It's, it's really a protection of your investment over time. Uh, for you know any device that you have so yeah so i'll i'll take a look at this is effectively the roadmap of where we've been right uh as you can see across there each version of niagara 4 has added features on top of the previous uh at 4.10 there you'll see the little mark of lts and here's another acronym we'll define lts is the long-term support version that is our current long-term support version. The rest are build versions where we add uh, add features. Uh, we used to do, and this is pre-Niagara 4, we did patches and updates as needed. And with Niagara 4, we transitioned to doing right about quarterly updates 
and then maintaining a long-term support version. Uh, what this means for the end user, for the SI, uh, for the facilities team, is that any JACE or station with an active SMA has all the features available, uh, regardless of when it was purchased, with it, with, obviously within the hardware's support lifetime. Um, at at 4.13, this is where I'm going to start talking about the future roadmap, uh, we introduced uh, the Jace 9000. We're going to talk about this a little, a little, a little hint here, right? Uh, which is the next generation of Jace controllers. It's been out for about a year now. This is kind of where we're crossing over. 413 and forward is is what is supported on the Jace 9000. Up through 415 is what is supported on the 8000. So there's a couple of there's a couple of crossovers there. Uh, 415 will be the last version of Niagara 4, and it'll remain the LTS going forward, the long-term support version going forward until the hard end of life of the device. Um, and like I mentioned, it'll also be the uh, the last version to run on the Jace uh, 8000. So as a specifier... Um, you're at a crossroads here for your customers. You have Jace 8000s that are available, and you have Jace 9000s that have been available for the last year plus. Um, we strongly, strongly suggest use of Jace 9000 wherever possible. They are similar in pricing. Obviously, the 8s are a little bit less uh, and may be attractive, but the reasoning for that, as you heard Jerome say, 415 being the last version for uh, Niagara 4 uh, to run on, the, and it can run on a 9000, uh, but coming, and we say coming in 2025, be a little more honest about this, we, our, our shot right now is end of 2025, uh, we'll be doing testing, likely coming in 2026, will be Niagara 5. Niagara 5 is only, repeat, only going to run on a 9000. So it will not be able to go backwards to an 8,000. And I've been, as you can tell with my gray hair, I've been in the software industry a long time. If you give programmers more and better and newer hardware, and we're going to talk about what that is in a moment, uh, they do really cool things with it. And they're not necessarily always backward compatible. Plus, I mean, there's some chipset issues and uh, compatibility things that would go on there. But we will have a transition path for our 8,000 users and for our Niagara 4 users to go to Niagara 5, but we really believe that at this point, you should be basing uh, your systems on Jace 9000s. They will run the Niagara 4 versions, and then it'll be seamless because they can uh, move you know, very easily to Niagara 5 when that time comes out uh, versus you know, having to get new hardware. So with that, we're going to let Jerome talk about the new 9000. Yeah, so so here's the Jace 9000. It looks very similar to the 8000 in form factor and that's intentional. Uh, I'll touch on that in a moment. But as for what's on it, right? First of all, it's a, it's a quad core processor, right? So we stepped up to a quad core processor so that we can be a strong hard device, you know, hard hard working device into the future, right? We doubled the amount of RAM, and we quad and it quadrupled the amount of usable storage inherently. We're transitioning from the Cunix uh, operating system, where we were reliant on another uh, developer to push updates. We've moved to the Linux-based Ubuntu Core 20 operating system. Uh, there will be a wireless model. There is a, a non-wireless model. There is a refreshed branding clip, right? So when you look at the 8000, what we refer to as the branding clip, by the way, is that blue square, that blue rectangle that says tritium on the left. That's where the different uh, manufacturers, it's a little piece of uh, uh, plastic that pops off and you can pop, you know, that, that the, the, each manufacturer has their own that, that goes in place there. This is a slightly different one. So it's, it's refreshed, it looks new. Uh, and now to the form factor comment, it's an easy drop-in. All of the terminations are in the same place. So it truly is as easy as popping out 
uh, popping the, the terminal strips out of the old, uh, the 8,000, taking it off the wall, putting this in its place and plugging it in. They're all in the same orientation and they're all in the same place. Um, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Let's go to uh, what the comparisons are here, right? To kind of give you an idea of where we came from. So on the 8,000 is a single core, one gigahertz uh, processor. We've gone to quad core, 1.6, right? This is where it's all like, hey, this is cool. We're moving from, uh, from the QNX operating system to Ubuntu. Our memory is going from one gig to two gigs. The storage is a uh, two gig uh, SD card to an eight gig SD card. Uh, there's and then where they're the same there's rs there's rs485 ports there's a pair of them on both uh we've added gig ethernet connection the data recovery is now four megabit uh the wi-fi is the same across there's a debug port for both um one thing to note is that there is also a bluetooth connectivity on this one too what's it used for you know what, we want somebody to do something cool with it. There's capability there, even if a tool hasn't been used for it yet or hasn't been created for it yet. Uh, and then I'm going to go back up to the USB backup. On the 8000, there was a USB-A port to allow for direct local backup. We found that that was not used very often and also it's a potential security issue because it's a connection into a piece of hardware. So it wasn't used. It's a potential short shortcoming. So it got removed. Okay. So. Yep. Here we go. So this is where, you know, we'd like to kind of wrap things up for you, give you some idea of what resources are available for you. Um, we do have a specifier page. Uh, I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Uh, it's where we keep our Division 25. Uh, we have some design guides and graphics guides and the like. Uh, it's, as you can see, the URL at the bottom. We also have a uh, code for you to see that. Uh, you know, hit the QR code. You can go there, and I'm going to click this in a minute. I'm going to let uh, Jerome quickly go through these, uh, or we'll, I'll we'll share talking about these and then I'll actually take you to the site where we'll wrap it up and then do the Q&A. So uh, events, uh, we do a, a biennial event, uh, Niagara Summit. Uh, we held it most recently this past spring uh, in California. We have, we'll be coming up in the, the uh, spring of 26, probably see Niagara 5 uh, debut there, uh, hopefully uh, at that point. And uh, Tritium Talks, just like you're attending today, and we'll mention those. Uh, they aren't just for specifiers. We have many different Tritium Talks available. And then uh, Jerome, tell us about the pro tips. Yeah, so there's also pro tips videos as well. Uh, we're actually right in the right in the heart of releasing a series of them now, focused on Niagara Cloud Suite. These are these are a video series where myself and and my colleagues on the sales engineer team. Uh, we put together quick uh, five to 15 minute videos right in that range, um, just kind of showing you some features, some useful tools, some pro tips, if you will. Uh, these can all be found on the uh, Tritium YouTube page uh, for reference. So go ahead and take a look. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as the floating head or the Max Hedron videos, right? <laughs> and beyond that, uh, you'll hear the phrase, um, Niagara community fairly often. And actually, that's what you'll use the Niagara community website uh, to connect to uh, NCS and, and, and a lot of other things. That's where you'll find the tech doc libraries. The tech doc library is a, is a truly powerful resource, uh, to, to use that term again, right? Um, it's something that I actually keep open in my browser all the time, because when I have a question or I'm a little unsure, that's the first place I go. I go and I search the libraries and most of the time I can find an answer. If there's not an answer there, you can go to the discussion boards, right? So community, community is a, a real thing within the Niagara world. Uh, there are discussion boards within the Niagara community site where you can ask a question and other users of the of the software, of the technology, they'll answer. Uh, those of us on our team, many of us 
keep an eye on those discussion boards as well and answer as quickly as we can, right? Or, or say, hey, here's the resource that you need to go to. Uh, this is also where you'll find release documents. So with each new release, uh, with each new update, we put out documents, hopefully trying to proactively answer uh, any questions you might have about it. Those are all available within the Niagara community world. And finally, we'll touch on training. Again. I'll touch on training again. There is in-person training available directly through us. There's also virtual training available directly through us. And it's not just through us. Many of our distribution partners, our distributors, they have uh, local uh, training programs as well, virtual as well as in-person. And then we also have some uh, exclusively training uh, partners as well. There's all these resources out there, many from us, from Tritium, and also many as a part of the community at large. Okay, so let's give you a quick view of the uh, ah. So it's opening up in that window. Let's pull that over here. So here is our website, uh, as we mentioned, the Tritium Talks, like you're searching today, and you can see our specifier series and other events that are going on. But what I really want to show you is our specifier page. So under Learn, so not maybe not as intuitive we should have here, but under Learn, by role, we do have a spot for specifying engineers. So this is not training classes, but it is informational for specifiers. So you can get some various ideas of what's going on. And then as I referenced that Niagara information performance statement, we, I see we have a Q and A on that. Uh, we'll get to our uh, division 25 design guide, resource guides, our actual division 25 spec, a smart building integration matrix to help you organize responsibility for a building, analytics specs, uh, the links to the various tritium talks, architectures, uh, case studies and the like. And then, of course, as Jerome mentioned, there were the libraries, the document libraries and papers and all types of uh, availability, and then our Tritium University for learning. So uh, with that, I'm going to close this part down and come back here. And just note that we have this, uh, there's about a half or about a dozen, half dozen, I'm sorry, uh, different specifier series events that we've run over the last couple of years. So you'll find these if you do a search on our site, uh, everything from the old 101 to this new 101, as well as uh, things like the uh, AI, Path from Smart to Intelligent Buildings, Digital Twins with Autodesk Tandem and Niagara Data Service, uh, and then specifying OT networks, analytics networks, cybersecurity, and uh, creating more powerful specifications. So a lot of good tools available. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to go to the Q&A section as we're winding down our time here. And our first question, uh, what is the best way for a QC inspector to verify that the Niagara software meets the NICS uh, statement for a fully open uh, installation? So Jerome, do you want to touch that or do you want me to? Uh, you know what, Mike, I, I'm actually going to leave it to you. I, I could answer it, but I think I would go on too long. I feel like you might be able to answer more <laughs> <Okay>. succinctly. <laughs> yeah, so we're, you're, you're going to look at the, the, and actually if you open the document, you'll see there, but you'll look at the, whether the stations are written uh, you know, to specific devices or not, and really be able to prove that, that it's not uh, limiting you to a particular brand or, or a particular uh, uh, tool. Uh, that it is open and that there's not any uh, proprietary software that you have access yeah. to the licenses. And then, of course, at the end of it, that all passwords uh, and usernames and the like are actually handed over to the owner so that they can uh, do that, that someone doesn't hold on to those. Obviously, we're presuming that the work has been paid for so that there's a reason that the person should receive all of their uh, good information. And I think maybe one, one thing I'll slide in here um, that... There is not one NICS statement. It it is it is a form that each OEM base each OEM partner effectively fills out to say this is our NICS statement. There are some that are what are referred to as open open, and there are some that are closed closed. It closed closed means that they only speak to their devices, but it's built on the Niagara framework. 
Uh, open closed is a, is a combination of the two. Open open means that you can connect to it with uh, any open uh, Niagara Workbench version um, and that it'll communicate with any other devices. This is where I'm trying really hard to not fall into the weeds of this, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's okay. the that's kind of the rough uh, explanation is that there's not a single NIC statement there's an array of them. And so you want to specify an open system. Yep. So our next question is, is an interesting one. Um, uh, wh what options are available when a contractor refuses to share the station admin credentials, platform credentials and passphrase with the property uh, manager and end user? Well, they you bought them, the license is in your name, uh, you own it and we can, uh, we can certainly help um, convince uh, the people to do that. And if need be, we can, uh, with obviously proper documentation that shows your ownership and these are correct people, uh, unlock those for you. So we'll, we'll just put it at that. Um, is there a cost estimating tool on the web for budgeting purposes for a new building? So as you saw, we are a, we are controls software developer. Uh, we have some devices that are sold through the various manufacturers. We don't sell those directly. Uh, and also, as you noticed in the slide where Jerome was talking about all that equipment that's in a building, we don't make any of that. So honestly, um, it, a, a, a tool, an estimating tool from us wouldn't do a lot of good because we don't control, you know, 95% of the stuff that goes into the building for this. But we have seen many of the manufacturers, the equipment manufacturers, the heavy equipment manufacturers have incredible tools out there. Uh, we're just at the control end and they can certainly uh, work with you there. I think I call us the nickel in the dollar equation. You know, the, the controls end of it's probably five or 10% of a, a job. So there's an awful lot of other stuff that goes into that. Uh, question, next question was, have the guide specs been updated for the Niagara 9000? So the, uh, the Division 25 is uh, live for the 9000, has that in there. I believe the guide spec has as well, although honestly now I'm doubting myself that, that you've asked this, so I will check that, but the, the Div 25 does reference the 9000 uh, in that. Um, what changes to the PX graphics capabilities can we expect yeah, I'll, with I'll N5? Touch on that. Okay, well, yeah, let me uh, let me finish answer asking here. So, with the Go N5 ahead. and JS 9000s, will we be able to configure PX graphics and elements directly through the web browser? Go Jerome. Yeah. So actually, uh, yes, and on 8000s as well. This is something that I, as soon as I saw your question, I kind of went, oh, I can't believe I didn't touch on this. 415, right? The PX web editor is coming in 4.15. I've tested it. It's pretty sweet. It's very useful. Uh, so yes, on N5 and the 9000s, yes, you'll be able to. But also on the 8000s uh, running version 4.15, you'll also have a web PX editor. Okay. Uh, next question was asking if we would share the PowerPoint. And yes, indeed, uh, the PowerPoint will be posted. It'll be a PDF of it on our website, just like all of the other, if you go to our website and look up the Tritium Talks, you can not only uh, download the presentation, but you can actually view the recording. So this session is being recorded uh, for your, you know, if you wanna go back and review it, if you have colleagues who didn't get to attend it, certainly send them a link, encourage them to go view the session. Uh, all of that's available to you. It'll probably be tomorrow by the time that's up there, uh, but uh, we will very soon have those there. Uh, is there uh, documentation, extensive documentation on the 8,000 end of life that we can give upper management to make the case starting all new projects at the 9,000? Um, I'm not sure what extensive documentation is uh, in terms of that, but uh, we have, uh, hmm. okay, Jerome, get me here. Did, did we have an <laughs> official statement that went out for EOL? I think we have. Um, I, I think I think so. We can we can uh, certainly dig around and and uh, and see. It's one of those things that we've we've talked about enough that I'm I'm a little unsure. I, I don't I don't necessarily want to say yeah we definitely have it because I'm not sure if I'm imagining that official document or not. Right. But the timeline, just so you understand, now and we talk about this is 2028 um, for our EOLs for. Uh, the certainly for what's that uh, N4 and I think then probably as well 
uh, for the 8000. JS9000 introduces four core CPU. Does that mean that Niagara starts supporting multi threading, allowing platforms to run so much faster and share the load between different services running on a station? J uh, Jerome, this is why you are here. Yeah. So, uh, best way for me to answer that is to say what it does is it, it breaks up what needs to be running on the processor at a time. So, I I don't know if I would call it multi-threading, but what it does is one one processor handles uh, things like startup, matters of that sort. Another processor handles the station, and that's the only thing that runs on that processor. Another processor hands, handles things like uh, backup, right? And the fourth one is there, kind of like the Bluetooth capabilities. The fourth one is there for, hey, when when somebody or us, when us or a partner comes up with a cool new thing, we have resources available. Another uh, one of those resources that, again, I, I didn't mention earlier when we were talking about the JACE 9000 specifically, is that that piece of hardware has an NPU, a neural processing unit built into it that is not yet being used. Somebody okay. is going to come up with something cool. So, right, that's that's kind of where it comes in. Um, I, I'm I'm careful with my words because I know I know some of my computer science friends might pick me apart if I say yeah it does multi-threading things like that, um, but okay. that's kind of what we mean by it. All right, just a couple questions left. We're really getting close to end time here. Uh, again, the EOL date for the uh, eight thousand and asking if the license for an eight thousand uh, will be transferable to a nine thousand. Well, right now you can take your uh, your N four stations which I believe is what we're talking about here. And you can run them on an eight or a 9,000. Uh, that's not a problem. We, I'm not sure how much we really mentioned this. We do talk about software maintenance agreements. We talked about it in the, in protecting your investment. Cu our customers who have long-term software maintenance agreements, which we uh, encourage, will be able to use, take their, uh, will be able to transition from Niagara 4 to Niagara 5. Obviously there'll be some conversion uh, needs and tools that we'll have to go through, but they will have the rights to uh, move over uh, from that standpoint. So separating hardware from software there for a second. Uh, okay, thank you. We've got an uh, address to send an, uh, an answer to for somebody. And then there's someone, I'm missing the bottom of this one. Um, as mentioned, 415 brings new web editor. Will this also introduce new object libraries to enable state-of-the-art graphics? <laughs> Go ahead, Drew. Yes, yeah, so, so, um... Yes, we'll update it's, it's, our graphics. A, How about that? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a tough uh, question to answer, and 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 I don't want to just disregard it. Um, the capabilities of of the PX page of the graphical of the of any user interface is up to the capabilities of the of the the designer that is that is building the UI, right? Um, right now, you can do some pretty some pretty cool things within PX. You can build your own libraries, things of that sort, or you can use you know Reflow graphics or uh, H build HTML pages. Right, all of those things are possible. So I, I I'm going to answer it with a with a yes, but you you kind of already can. It, it just means you'll be able to do it through the web browser as opposed to doing it through through Workbench. If that if that's clear as mud. <laughs> Okay. So all of you, thank you so much for your time. We ran right to the end. I just ran through a couple of slides for those who are viewing it online so that you have all of the resources there. Of course, these will be included in the PDF documents. So you'll have all of the links to each of the products, which are on our website, as you can see. Uh, thanks for joining us and have a wonderful day. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and contact us. Appreciate it.